thank you for joining me. The reason that I really was anxious to have you on the show is because your life story is one that's quite incredible. You started life with a lot of challenges, didn't you? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, even being born premature, that was a challenge. So. And, and, and when I read your biography, uh, a number of people sort of said, well, he doesn't stand much of a chance. And yet here you are. What was it in you that kept pushing you forward? even though you know, you're in an environment that sort of goes, eh, you know, we're not sure. Well, I th that's a good question. And uh, I think my response would be number one is when I started school in grade one, I failed grade one. You failed grade I one. I failed grade one because my language was my, my own language, Malseat. And it's only English that I began to learn in grade one. It was mainly because I could not read. I knew everything else, but I just could not read English. And so, the decision was made, okay, try again. And I think when you have failed in something, you try to compensate by working hard. And well, I think that made a difference. I'd like to challenge you that you tried again. Not everybody does. And so I'm, oh. <laughs> what I'd like to know is, like, are you able to revisit that point in your own experience where you say, okay, I'm not going to give up? Oh, well, I think it's part, of the, it's part of my own healing journey. I think as a child at the time, I was only six years old, mm -hmm. and uh, everyone in the community is saying, hey, dummy, hey, stupid, how come you... They were actually calling you that? Oh, gosh, yeah. And yeah. I mean, those are, those are uh, very charitable names. Uh, but the whole community <laughs> may, ridiculed me. And, and when you have a name like Graydon, uh, and you're called great. Hey, great, did you great? Of course, the answer was obviously no. So I, mm -hmm. the summer was a difficult summer. And so, but as a child, psychologists will tell you, you bury the hurt. You let it go deep within and not, and you survive. And I think this is what I did. I survived. And then I said, well, I'm going to make sure that no one ever ridicules me again. Um, I'll make sure that I know more than anybody else. So you go overboard on the other stuff, which is trying to be as smart as you can be or smarter than anybody else, which also has its own difficulties. Well, you wound up being pretty smart. Well, <laughs> fortunate, I call it. Fortunate, yeah. So you, you wind up graduating from school in an environment where graduating from elementary school, let alone high school, it starts to become unusual. Yes. You go on to university. Uh, you studied... What did well, you study? Well, my background, my undergraduate degree is a, master, is a degree in science. It's, an, it's a science degree. Mm -hmm. And I had great hopes of going on into graduate work in, in math, but it didn't work out. So I ended up going to law school, and, uh, and which was a different new environment for me. Mm -hmm. and, and then after I finished law school, I article, of course, to, get, to be able to practice law. And, and then I received an invitation if I wanted to go study social work in Ontario. They were recruiting First Nation students to study a Master's of Social Work, so I agreed. My wife and I talked about it, and I said, okay, let's give it a try. And that was a two-year program, a program where you would study for four months and be on the field for four months, and, and then spring term, summer break, and then in the fall you would start again with a placement and then finish off with an academic term. So I finished uh, formally my education in 1974. Did you go to work in social work or did you go back to law? I went back to law, interestingly enough. A brother of mine, an older brother, was the chief of our community and there was a land claim and he said, would you come and work for our community? Uh, you're the only lawyer I can trust. So my wife is from St. John, New Brunswick, so that's what said, okay, we'll go back to New Brunswick. Did you win that land claim? Uh, well, <laughs> that's another story in this cell. <laughs> Uh, the, the minister of the day was Jean Chrétien in the Liberal government. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had agreed that the community would have resources to hire a lawyer. So uh, I was hired. The funding never came. So I told my brother after a month's work, I said, look at this, there's no sense in you getting in deficit for employing me. Uh, that's all right, I can find work either as a lawyer or as a social worker, because mm -hmm. by then I'm a, I'm a social worker as well. So reluctantly, he said, well, okay. So, but as a result of that, I ended up working full-time with uh, the Union of New Brunswick Indians, which was a political organization uh, and uh, set up to help the interests of all uh, the two tribes in Malseat, in, in New Brunswick, Mi'kmaq and Malseat. So that's what I ended up doing for 
a period of almost uh, 15 years. So we fast forward, your career m m moves on. We get to the point where um, there are land claims decisions that say um, you have the right to uh, uh, fish outside of the commercial fishery, right. you have the right to access to uh, forest, uh, you know, the forest resources within New Brunswick. Um, there are opportunities that come along and you become a judge. Yeah. But you look at the landscape in New Brunswick and it's not much different than uh, that of First Nations communities across Canada. Access to opportunity is still limited. Right. Why is it so important <clears throat> for First Nations communities to be given that same access that everybody else in Canada has? Like, wh why do we need to, as a nation, embrace that this is the right way to go? Our people practiced on land, let's face it, fish, animals were our sustenance, as well as our medicines, as well as our clothing. So to exist, to feed your family, to feed the community, then you had a hunting, gathering society. And part of that way of life also means it's a holistic way of life. It's also a spiritual existence. The, you know, the fact that the animals are our brothers and sisters, the fact that the plants are part of our creation. And this is what we're taught. So this is the way our people lived. They moved around. They were mobile. They had to. Families could only go to certain areas because of limited amounts of game, limited amount of resources to survive. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the Europeans come. And then the Europeans have a different concept, first of all, of land. Yeah. That's the big thing. Uh, and many, many in Europe did not own land. Uh, they were slaves, laborers, serfs mm -hmm. of people who were wealthy, people who owned land. And so all of a sudden they come to an area where there's all kinds of land and nobody seems to own it. There's no residences as such, you see. It's, they think it's vacant land. Okay, it's ours. We've discovered something. When you have that kind of an identity of land, that's different. Mm -hmm. The second thing is all of a sudden now the availability of game, the availability of fish or the availability of other animals, then they're harvested for trade. So those two concepts then begin to conflict with the Aboriginal way of life. And it began back then. Mm -hmm. And it still has not been fully resolved yet in our country in terms of current economic circumstances or in terms of current land concepts or in, in terms now even of indigenous spirituality. If we take a look at Delgamook moving forward, right. which was a landmark uh, case here in British Columbia, but it, it reverberates across the country, right. which uh, you know, puts an, uh, an obligation to consult. And then we look at Silkotin on top of that, which acknowledges like, that you need there's to get consent. Yeah, yeah. There's, well, yeah. not just a duty to consult, yeah. but you need to obtain consent. Yeah. Uh, and, and so now we're, we're changing. And, in, and Bill Gallagher in his book, Resource Rulers, says you take a look at the way that the courts have been deciding these over the last 20 some odd years, virtually all decisions are going in favor of First Nations. So I feel like we are starting to move to a point where there is an understanding and there is a legal basis to say, okay, we now need to, to recognize First Nations are a part of the equation. In our conversation, I was hoping that we were beyond just the starting line. But the more we talk, I, I, I get the feeling starting that Starting line keeps moving back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it still moving back? Despite well, Delgamook and Silco team. Okay, let's, yeah. just, let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's look at the last decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Yeah. And uh, I've read it. Yeah. A couple of times to understand the pattern now that Chief Justice McLaughlin and the court is saying. Mm -hmm. You see, it starts with the Calder decision. Yes. The Calder decision here in British Columbia, mm -hmm. which split at the Supreme Court of Canada level. Yeah. In which the three justices of the Supreme Court of Canada said Aboriginal rights existed, but now it has been extinguished by force of law and regulation. Three other judges said. Aboriginal title exists and continues to because it has not been extinguished. Right. And the seventh judge says, well, because of technicality on procedure, I'm tossing the thing out. So we had a Supreme Court of Canada in 1973 that was deadlocked. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the, the Aboriginal title was allowed that, in fact, it was, admitted, it was an admitted state of fact. Mm -hmm. So what did that do to the governing Liberals Party at the time? 
headed by Prime Minister Trudeau. Right. All of a sudden, you have a very strong minister, Len, Len Marchand, here in British Columbia, mm -hmm. who was part of the cabinet of Trudeau. Right. And he was being confronted by the NISCA leaders and saying, hey, wait a minute now, what are we going to do now? All of a sudden, what our ancestors have been telling us is now in existence. It was then a recognition that Aboriginal title exists, exists, yep. which is what the Niskas were saying all along. Mm -hmm. Now, it took a long time for the eventual uh, conclusion of a treaty between the federal government, the provincial government, and the Niska nation to say, okay, now all of a sudden we are going to have jurisdiction over a certain parcel of land to control development, to control how our people will live, to control the whole Right. way of life of the of the NISCA. Well, that was a treaty that was signed by the Glenn Clark government. Uh, was it not the NISCA? That's, that's uh, right, uh, but that's only yeah. one tribe. Yeah. Now, there are many tribes here in British Columbia, and it's, I'm not sure where they are in that tri particular treaty process that was set up. It's been, it's, it's done. Like, they have control over their territory. No, no, I don't NISCA, oh, yeah. but I'm talking about the other tribe. Oh, the within, other tribes. Within, within British Columbia. So, <laughs> it's so in a deadlock. It's in a deadlock, but, yeah. and yet, you got the Supreme Court of Canada saying Aboriginal title, this latest decision is Aboriginal title exists. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Now, is Aboriginal title something that is a form of land title system? And of course, the Supreme Court of Canada said again, as they did Delgamook, and as they said back in 1973, it's different. It's unique You're because right. of the special relationship that exists between the tribes yeah. and the federal government. The crown is the, the title I use is the crown. Mm -hmm. A little while ago, you mentioned about Royal Proclamation of 1763. Yeah. After the conclusion of the war between uh, French and France and England over control of America, after the Treaty of Paris, mm -hmm. 1763. Then the British issued this proclamation. Yeah. Which says that okay now, in order to maintain good relationship with the nations or tribes, of people who we are connected. This is what we will do. Mm -hmm. Anybody now who sits on Indian land, you gotta go because you don't have permission mm -hmm. because the tribes were complaining. We got people coming in, taking away our resources, taking away our, what, our way of life. Stealing our land. Well, mm -hmm. you know, stealing our land. And, and they're, they're, yeah. they're using our land <laughs> and, 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 and not leaving. And, 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 and when we say get out, they're yeah. not moving. Right. So. But it was also important then for the British government to control the economy yep. of that land. So they say anyone who wants to do then business with the tribe has to get permission or license from us, then that will give it the okay. Again, very few licenses were issued and very few people were removed. And so the Aboriginal grievance began. And, but they needed this statement so they could begin to have these treaties signed, what they call the number of treaties, mm -hmm. which started in Ontario. Because all of a sudden now, Canada, I mean the British, want to expand to the West Coast. Yep. They didn't want the Americans moving up. Yep. So in order to do that, they begin to conclude these treaties. So this is where then government begins to control these, what we would call Indian reservations. The Treaty of 1752, which the Mi'kmaq signed, said that in fact, the federal go the government the government would set up these truck houses so that if the Mi'kmaq went to bring their hunting or fishing benefits to a truck house for a trade, for goods. Okay, that's commerce. Yeah. That's commercial. So how come the federal government would not allow the Mi'kmaq to exercise any commercial interests before the Marshall, latest Marshall decisions? Why? Because it's competed with the commercial interests the powerful commercial fishermen interests and industry who benefited from uh, fishing or whatever exploitation of resource. You multiply... Who voted for Well, I'm not sure they voted for, but I mean, it, that's a system <laughs> or that was there. at least there. they had a voice whichever, to vote which, for. Whichever yeah. way they influence governments, what I'm saying, yeah. whatever way they influence governments. Okay, then in New Brunswick, you deal with the resources now of timber. Yep. The timber then is the consequence of the Marshall decisions where then all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, now we've got crown lands in Canada. There's all kinds of woods in New Brunswick. Why can't we access to that wood so that we can make a living out of that wood? And I can tell you in New Brunswick, it was very, very, very violent that occurred. It was war. Well, it or was. Close it, to it. It, it, there mm -hmm. were a lot of strong disagreements. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the 
Megamo and the Mouse, it had to go to courts, which eventually they won. Yep. But at what cost? The commercial governments, hey, wait a minute now. All of a sudden, we can't get our amount of wood off Crown land. We have to sacrifice a certain percentage so the tribes can come in and say, okay, we let them harvest it. They don't even know how to cut trees. I mean, so, but... but that, that's the thinking of... Um, a very powerful. Like, if, if I benefit, you lose. Yeah. When, in fact, if you benefit and I benefit, we all win. Do we and not? That's not that's not the way shareholders and multinational corporations think. The multi corporation multinational corporations, shareholders, they want a profit. Why else would you put ten thousand dollars in a company unless you got something in return? And the only way you get something in return is if in fact you harvest, come up with a product, the price is high enough so that the return to you makes money. So that's, that's if you have a purely linear thought. But a lot of multinational corporations in resource development, that's the way they think. Mm -hmm. And the government says, okay, we make uh, a royalty out of this, or we get taxes out of this. In other words, there's some kind of, we get money from this particular yeah. exploitation resource. So now is the government going to say, uh oh, are we going to lose a tax base here? Because if First Nations come in, what are they going to do with what they want? You know, what happened in New Brunswick is interesting because at, by then I was a provincial court judge and then a retired justice from the Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Lafore, and I were asked to have a two-person uh, commission yep. go around New Brunswick to find out what this was all about. What were the ramifications of all this? Well, and we did. We issued a report back in 1999 in which we detailed all the issues that the provincial and federal governments were involved with the two First Nations in New Brunswick. Beautiful report, but like all beautiful reports, it's gathering wonderful dust. Yes, and sitting on the shelf. Sitting on the shelves, okay. I had to search a little bit to find it online. Yeah, yeah. but it's still <laughs> online, thank goodness. Uh, but, but, okay, now, jumpstart to today with shale gas in New yes. Brunswick, which is a big topic. Okay, right. resource yeah. development. Rexton, right. Well, Rexton yeah. is only one area, yeah. but Shale gas, which is a resource, still sitting on maybe Aboriginal land. Mm -hmm. And you're asking Aboriginal people, would you agree then to allow companies to come in and exploit that particular resource to the benefit of everybody but us? And so you see, so then you say, okay, what is the Supreme Court of Canada saying in this case? If Aboriginal title does exist in areas where there was no succession of land, yeah then maybe governments, this is, hello, you better begin to sit down, you begin to listen, discuss, and find out what happens. So in light of the Sokotine decision, are we in a position where we can at least now start to say we can create agreements where everybody does benefit? Or are we still at a, at a stalemate? That'll be up to the parties. That, I think people, are, people in governments are still trying to find out the ramifications of this key decision. I still talk to First Nations leaders who say, okay, let's figure out how to work together. There isn't the, okay, the right. Supreme Court has recognized that this is ours now, go away. It's yeah. like, okay, how do we build on this? And I guess that's the fundamental question. How do we build on what are still fragile foundational beginnings? Well, I think this case, along with Delgamook, although this is, I think this is a better decision, Delgamook, yeah. personally, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. What this is saying to the, because again, and essentially this decision is provincial, yeah. but the feds were brought in as well because of, of the indigenous interest. So now how do you get the federal government, provincial government, and the First Nation governments to sit down and say, okay, can we do something here? Yeah. It's going to take a while. What is it that we can work out? That's the challenge. Now, how long is it going to take to conclude a treaty of, of this collection of individuals, of tribes, with the federal and provincial governments? Another 25 years? Okay. And the resources are still on the land. And that's only one resource, timber. We are no. not talking about what's in the soil. Well, the most important resource, though, is the people. To people, that's true. But and if, and if, they're, if they're in limbo, if they're stuck, because yeah. they can't realize opportunity, that's the greatest loss, is it not? 
Well, it, but it sounds like the Great Lust, but we can never, I mean, as First, as first Nation, now, do you remember what happened with the McKenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry? Now, I remember that time I was just fresh out of law school, fresh mm -hmm. out of university, and Justice Tom Berger went right across the country right. to find out the impact of trying to shift oil from Prudhoe Bay and then eventually through Canada and the American market. Mm -hmm. And then at the time when his report was filed, he said there should be a 10-year moratorium on development while First Nations people then are trained to participate actively and benefit from any kind of resource development. Yeah. Change of governments, change of priorities, more multinational corporations, oil companies start coming in, more development of First Nations leadership. And then we're still, still talking in the North about development of resource, mm -hmm. not of a resource that's still there. Yeah. And the same thing, I don't know what kind of mineral resources avail is on this particular land of this last court decision, I don't know. But if there is any mineral development and a company, multinational corporation in our economic times now, it says, well, yeah, maybe I can go in there and develop something. This is where the discussions will begin to take place. And how it'll be resolved, I can't tell you. I don't know. I mean, they know probably what they want. They have legal counsel. Mm -hmm. They'll have all kinds of expertise in certain areas to see, do we want to participate in this as partners? And I think mm -hmm. unless the governments recognize First Nations as partners, development is going to be very limited. So I start my discussion with you thinking, okay, maybe there are practical steps right now that we can say to young members in First Nations communities, here are things that you can do to realize your potential. The groundwork still hasn't been laid, is, is what I get from a, a good part of our conversation. The whole parameter of education, be it right from the, well, let's start from the elementary level, the schools, secondary, post-secondary, all these have to have some kind of a component dealing with First Nations. I you, agree. you cannot have it, you need it. Right. You need it. That in fact, hey, this is going to enrich me. This is going to make me more understanding, more appreciative of what Canada is all about. Well, my feeling is that until we do this, we as a country cannot realize the true potential of Canada. Oh, this, I agree with you. This is a wound that has to be healed yeah. and everybody has to benefit from it. That's right. I so much appreciate you coming in and giving us your experience right. and your perspective on this. Thank well, thank you very, you very much. much, and I yeah. appreciate this opportunity. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.